Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We're uh, on Horizon's uh, Medical Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF. Uh, we're just going to give it a minute or two for uh, all attendees to get on, and we'll begin shortly. So uh, just give it a minute or so, and we'll start. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll begin. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Mark Noble, and I'm the uh, Head of Sales Strategy at Horizons ETFs. And uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us this we on this webinar for the Horizons Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol HMMJ. You know, it's rare that you actually get to talk about something that's completely new. Often the investment management business is about breathing life into old ideas, you know, finding new iterations on stocks and bonds and strategies that we're all very familiar with. But the number of instances where investors have the actual opportunity to get in on the ground floor of an entirely new asset class is a real true rarity. And, you know, that's the opportunity that presents itself with marijuana or cannabis-focused stocks. The legal marijuana industry as an investable asset class really didn't exist more than three years ago, and it's only in the last year that it has become something that can sustain an investment product like an exchange-traded fund. So at Horizons ETFs, we're really excited to become the first ETF, uh, well, actually to launch the first ETF in the world that provides exposure to marijuana stocks. And this launch has been met with huge fanfare, receiving coverage from almost every major financial publication in the world, uh, you know, everything from the Wall Street Journal to The Economist, to all the major publications in Canada. And it was also probably the biggest three-day launch of any Canadian listed ETF in history when it launched in early April, uh, breaking records both in uh, organic asset gathering as well as trading volume. So no, no surprise, probably many of you are already well-versed in this ETF. And we don't have to do a lot of awareness on what it is. So really today what we're talking about is more about how this ETF works and some of the developments with this ETF since we launched in early April. And uh, for those who aren't aware, HMJ continues to be the only publicly listed ETF in the world that provides exposure to marijuana stocks. And much of this has to do with both the unique regulatory and legal environment of the Canada. And you know what? Quite a bit also has to do with the foresight of our speaker today, who is Steve Hawkins, the co-CEO and president of Horizons ETFs. So Steve is going to spend the next 20, 30 minutes explaining why we launched a marijuana-focused ETF, how the ETF works, and some of the key long-term advantages of this structure, as well as he'll address some of our recent rebounds from two weeks ago where we added four new names to the ETF portfolio. So I'm so sure some of you, particularly if you're investors, are keen to hear about some of those names. Now, before I turn it over to Steve, I want to cover a few key issues on the webinar. Uh, first and most important, uh, this is an interactive webinar. So at the end of the webinar, uh, which will be about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, we will have a, a period for Q question and answers. If you have any question, and you know what we typically find is people usually have a question that they want to answer when they hear a point that they want clarified, please put that into the uh, Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And what we'll do is we'll ideally address that at the end of the call. We also, you'll notice if you look to the left side of your screen, have a resource box. And that's really important for anyone that's new to this product. We have a product sheet that explains how HMMJ works. And we also have a Horizons product lineup uh, where you can learn about some of the other ETFs that uh, we offer at Horizons. Now, Steve Hawkins is our president and co-CEO, and uh, he is responsible for the day-to-day -day business and affairs of the firm. And with more than 25 years of experience in the investment industry, Mr. Hawkins has been with Horizons or its ETFs or its predecessors and affiliates since 2007. Prior to this, Mr. Hawkins was also the managing partner and director with Joe Funds Management Incorporated, a subsidiary of Jovian Capital Corporation from late 2005 to 2011. From 2000 to late 2005, Mr. Hawkins served in a dual capacity as Chief Investment Officer of Management for First Asset Investment Management, as well as Vice President Compliance for its then-parent company, AMG Canada Incorporated. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Steve, who's going to uh, tell us all about uh, HMJ and uh, some of the unique uh, opportunities of that ETF in today's market. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was a great introduction and, uh, to Horizons and the ETF itself. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, to bring you up to speed on what's going on with the fund and 
uh, and the industry as a whole. I'll uh, give you a, a sort of a bunch of slides and we'll go through those things and we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, first and all, background uh, with respect to the fund. Uh, we launched it in a early April of this year. The fund itself, um, or the ETF, seeks to replicate, uh, to the extent possible, the performance of the North American Medical Marijuana Index. Uh, we recently changed the name of the ETF and dropped the word medical. Uh, the index itself, we understand, will be dropping the, the word medical out of the index name as well. Uh, the index is designed to provide exposure to a performance of a basket of North American publicly listed companies with significant business activities in the marijuana industry. Um, as Mark said, ticker is HMMJ. Uh, as of last week, we actually listed HMMJ.U, so this if gives you the opportunity to buy units of the ETF in U.S. dollars in your U.S. brokerage account. Um, it is the same QCIP, um, so there's no difference between buying HMMJ or HMMJ.U, just how you're going to pay for that um, and in the type of account that you're buying it. Uh, management fee, 75 basis points. Uh, we do not hedge the foreign exposure that's in the fund. Uh, so there is Canadian exposure and U.S. exposure um, in the fund. It's available for all registered, non-registered accounts. Um, and uh, the ticker ID for the index is N-A-M-M-A-R um, on Bloomberg. Um, we do rebalance the ETF on a quarterly basis. The index rebalances on a quarterly basis as well. So we try and uh, uh, line up our portfolio rebalancing uh, along with the, the index itself. Um, Mark talked briefly about the, the opportunity for marijuana. You know, we see this as a huge growth potential sector. It is a new sector uh, to the, you know, the equity investment world for all intents and purposes. Um, a lot of marijuana investing companies um, as of last year, and the industry has grown in such a way uh, with more and more uh, publicly listed securities that we are able to produce a, an index and an ETF um, that we felt was liquid and provided enough diversified exposure to this sector. Um, you know, we see the growth project projections for the Canadian marijuana market um, just growing exponentially over the next several years, especially with the um, legalization from a recreational use, uh, which we see happening in Canada um, for July 1st, 2018, as announced by our federal government um, uh, back in April. So, you know, huge growth potential for this market, both in the medical and the um, recreational use from that perspective. Um, you know, we see Canada um, as, as a huge cannabis-oriented uh, country uh, because of the medical um, legalization here. Um, in the U.S., though, we see um, medical marijuana has been approved in um, at a state level in 26 to 27 states, I believe. Um, you know, it's still illegal at the federal level, still a Schedule One narcotic. Um, you know, we cannot, uh, from a Canadian producer's projective, um, we cannot ship marijuana into the U.S. Um, so marijuana has to be grown in a state, has to be sold in that state, and the proceeds have to be used in that state. Otherwise, they are violating essentially state laws um, and then potentially dealing with uh, federal um, uh, law infringements. So uh, with Canada, uh, because of the legalization that we have here from a federal perspective at the medical level, um, we have a lot more opportunity. We have free borders. We're able to distribute it outside of Canada under with specific licenses. Um, uh, the different producers are. So there's a lot of growth, continued growth potential for the Canadian producers uh, of medical marijuana at this stage. Um, the index itself um, currently has 20 names in it. Um, the components are all listed on North American uh, public exchanges. Um, uh, three of the companies are listed on the TSX. Ten of the companies are listed on the TSX Venture. Uh, one listed on the Indian Stock Ex or Securities Exchange. Four listed on NASDAQ. One is listed on, or sorry, two are listed on New York um, from that perspective. Um, all of the companies are, uh, have major activities in marijuana or marijuana um, uh, derivatives uh, from that perspective. So uh, they could be producing, distributing me medical marijuana. Uh, they could be producing biopharmaceuticals or bioproducts, uh, ancillary 
Um, uh, other businesses include, um, you know, fertilizers, um, as in Scott's miracle Grow, which is one of the main components of the index currently. Uh, currently, the index methodology is market cap weighted, so uh, we do look at all of the names. Um, uh, the index looks at all the names at the time of the rebalancing. Um, it weights them accordingly based on the market cap, but no name can represent more than 10% um, in the index. So when we last rebalanced um, as of June, uh, there were five names which had significantly higher market caps and would result in approximately a 10% weight uh, in the portfolio as of um, the June rebalance. We do rebalance on a quarterly basis. Uh, we want to make sure that we are doing this because the industry is very rapidly evolving. You know, we see more and more names joining the index and joining the ETF portfolio um, every single quarter. Um, uh, from that perspective, we have new IPOs in the marijuana space in Canada almost monthly now, um, if not more than monthly. So we see continued significant growth from an, an availability perspective to the index uh, to grow the number of constituents and for the ETF portfolio to, to diversify uh, even further from that perspective. Uh, the index, we look at a minimum market capitalization of $75 million. You might think that that's small, but you know, many of the marijuana companies are out there. They're just starting. They just built their grow operations. They've just got licensing. They've just got financing from one of the, the several sources of financing in Canada. Um, and so it, it actually takes a little bit for the companies to establish themselves as a $75 million market cap company. So uh, we felt that that was a reasonable threshold when we were building the index with Selective. Uh, we're looking at for, uh, at least 75,000 shares a day in average daily trading volume and uh, at least $250,000 a day in, in um, average daily trading value um, over the 30-day periods before that. Uh, the access to cannabis um, in Canada um, you know, goes back many, many years, um, as Mark was mentioning. ACMPR, which was the um, uh, Medical Access Act, um, uh, has been around for a little while. Um, there are uh, just over 40 licensed companies now in Canada um, that are able to produce and distribute medical marijuana under that. Um, you know, we've seen 90 or more than 100,000 now um, medical marijuana users in Canada across many provinces. Uh, with Ontario and BC being the largest users at the stage. Um, you know, the uh, revenues that are estimated, and we talked about it a little bit uh, previously from a growth perspective, are estimated to be at least $1.1 uh, by 2020, and that is just for medical. That was not including the recreational use. So including recreational use, you know, we see this number uh, two to three times even larger uh, for 2020 from that perspective. Uh, currently, um, uh, the index uh, has 20 names in it. Um, the uh, performance of the, the names in the portfolio um, and, and index have been um, a little bit rocky over the last couple of months. Um, marijuana stocks generally were up 300 to 400 percent in 2016, so we saw huge growth. Uh, we can see in some of the, the one-year numbers uh, for some of these companies are very, very large. Um, as of you know, the last month to three months, um, uh, after the launch of the ETF, we saw a very quick run-up um, uh, in, uh, in the ETF and the valuations of the marijuana companies. You know, we flooded the market very quickly with you know, 100 and 125 million of investable assets which had to go into these companies. Um, so that helped um, uh, perpetuate the, the uh, run that these uh, marijuana companies were having. Uh, since then, we've seen a little bit of a pullback in the marijuana industry. It was probably very uh, needed from that perspective because the companies have been running. Um, uh, uh, you know, things from a long-term growth perspective, we still see significant uh, growth prospects ahead for all of the marijuana companies, the marijuana industry, the marijuana sector itself. Um, but it was nice to see a little bit of a pullback in marijuana stocks. Uh, it's not a bubble. We don't see anything happening from a burst perspective, um, but it was uh, a little bit of a pullback for uh, a long-term 
um, uh, outperformance again relative to the market. So I'm going to go through some of the little individual names that are in the portfolio itself. Um, uh, I mentioned previously Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, you know, if you Google Scott's Miracle Grow and you Google marijuana, uh, you can see the numerous articles um, that there are about Scott's investing into uh, the medical marijuana and the recreational marijuana industry itself. You know, they're just a third-party provider. Uh, but they are instrumental to, I guess, the marijuana industry as a whole and its growth uh, with the hydroponics, soil, fertilizers, pesticides. Uh, there's a lot of ancillary growth prospects for Scots um, uh, it, from this industry itself. And, you know, they see the long-term upside for it, and they are very, very public about um, how they've invested their assets into this uh, burgeoning industry. Um, G Double Pharmaceuticals, uh, one of the cannabinoid, uh, largest cannabinoid producers. It's very focused on its cannabinoid science itself. Um, you know, we see this. It's the second largest market cap company in the portfolios itself. Uh, it's very, very focused on medical marijuana uh, or you know THC derivative products um, for medical use from that perspective. And we thought. This part of the industry uh, was very, very representative of the growth of medical marijuana um, and marijuana itself uh, from that perspective. Um, doesn't really need a lot of introduction. Canopy, um, the largest and oldest um, of the uh, marijuana stocks listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, first security, first marijuana company to join the TSX Composite Index. Um, uh, you know, from a market cap perspective, very large <clears throat> in the billion dollar range, uh, growing substantially all the time, growing operations um, in Canada, focused very solely on Canada um, from that perspective, but one of the very first licensees and, and one of the strong growth prospect um, companies from that perspective in the portfolio. Um, the most widely known out of all of the Canadian medical marijuana producers. And they appropriately changed their stock symbol this year to weed. Um, so we weren't able to launch with that symbol, um, uh, the ETF, unfortunately. Um, Afria, um, the next largest IPO um, uh, earlier on uh, last year um, from, from a Canadian perspective, um, also listed on the TSX. They have started to expand some of their operations into the U.S. from that perspective, but uh, a very, very large company focused solely on medical marijuana um, and distributing that medical marijuana across Canada um, and looking at um, uh, shipping outside of Canada now as well um, and growing um, uh, in partnerships that it's being building in the U.S. Uh, for potential growth uh, operations in, in Florida, and Colorado are, the, I think, are the two biggest ones that they're, they're looking at. Uh, so uh, Afria shouldn't need too much mention as well. It's been in the portfolio right from the start, and we expect this to be a, continued to be a, a strong performer from a performance perspective. Um, Insys, another uh, pharmaceutical therapeutic company. Um, I think the third largest market cap uh, in the portfolio. It is NASDAQ listed. Um, it is a very specialized pharmaceutical um, company working on drugs. They have some very specific um, uh, drugs that are uh, specific to this industry, Marinol being the biggest one, um, uh, which is a, a THC sort of derivative or replacement from that perspective. We do get questions as to why this uh, company would be in the index um, and, and the ETF portfolio ourselves. You know, we believe, again, this is from a line of company that is important and shows the overall growth of the, the medical uses of mer medical or of marijuana itself. And INSA supports that um, uh, perspective. Um, so the ETF holdings currently, I previously uh, provided you with the index performance. Um, uh, index holdings. Uh, right now, we have 20 different uh, portfolio securities in there. Uh, two of the index names are not in our portfolio, and we have two portfolio names which are not in the index. 
we do apply uh, some stratified sampling um, on an overall basis to the portfolio relative to the index, but the primary objective and strategy of the fund is to give a broad diversification representation of the medical marijuana industry and for us to track the performance of the index. And so how we go about doing that from constructing the portfolio perspective, there is some discretion in there, but it is very, very minute in because this is a passive index tracking product. Almost all passive index tracking pro products out there have to perform some level of stratified sampling to replicate the performance in the in index. And, and we do the same thing here with um, HMMJ's portfolio. Uh, right now, the portfolio is breaking out uh, approximately 60% to Canada, 30% uh, to US, and 10% uh, to Great Britain, which is the uh, GW um, pharmaceutical company, which is listed on NASDAQ. Um, one of the changes um, that happened recently is uh, with respect to AFRIA because of its um, small investments that it has made in the U.S. and, and um, uh, it is actually producing and generating um, uh, medical marijuana in the U.S. Um, working with the TMX and the securities regulators here, we were able to change the strategy slightly, um, which would allow us to in continue to be invested in companies um, that have some exposure to the U.S., um, some being the very key word. Um, you know, we do not invest in issuers that are primarily uh, or domiciled in the U.S. and are only producing um, and only um, generating profits from the U.S., um, so that is not uh, from the marijuana industry itself. From legalized drugs, that's a completely different story, so that's where the INSYS, GW Pharmaceutical, uh, Zenerba, as an example, um, come into play. But those that are producing, uh, cultivating, producing, and distributing marijuana in the U.S., there are some exposure to those companies. Um, many of the Canadian companies have made investments into the U.S. Um, in the uh, potential, uh, potential production of medical marijuana in various different states where medical marijuana is approved. But we are really focused only on those that have some exposure to some exposure to medical marijuana in the U.S. So uh, we're still um, not focused at all on any companies that have recreational um, use distribution in the U.S. Um, and, you know, until such time as, you know, the rules become clear from a, a U.S. legislation perspective, and who knows what's going to happen under today's U.S. political regime, um, you know, we just don't know. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns, but we... Uh, as an ETF issuer that is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, we're going to do whatever we can to follow the rules of the Toronto Stock Exchange here. We want to continue to provide the listing and liquidity that the TSX offers us for having HMMJ listed on that exchange. So some of the new things uh, that have changed in the HMMJ portfolio uh, recently with the, the June rebalance, so Invictus MD Strategies uh, had an IPO um, uh, and earlier this year in financing. Um, it didn't make the initial launch of the ETF, um, but thereafter um, we've seen the company continue to grow. Um, it is a BC-based um, uh, cultivator distributor um, from that perspective, and um, you know, we saw this as a great addition to the portfolio. Um, and, you know, we hope that it continues to meet all of the underlying requirements of the, uh, of the index so that we can uh, continue to be invested into uh, Invictus from that perspective. Uh, Maricam, it is an Ontario-based company, um, uh, also became, um, uh, did an IPO uh, earlier this year, <clears throat> or reverse takeover, however you want to call it. Um, so became um, uh, really public securities from that perspective. There was a lot of private um, financing into this company previously. Um, this in Canada it is one of you know the 40 plus um, licensed providers here. Um, you know we see them continuing to build out um, new space, um, continuing to lower their costs on an overall basis of the production of. Uh, of their medical marijuana, and we see this as a you know a positive company um, uh, from that place going forward. It also 
um, recently uh, received its um, uh, license to export, and it is one of the largest producers from Canada that is exporting to Germany where medical marijuana is also uh, legalized from a federal perspective. Um, Abcan Medicinals, um, uh, it uh, produces, stores, and sells medical marijuana. Um, you know, in Canada, uh, we see this as, again, another strong representative of a, of a growing industry. Um, they're based primarily in Ontario, um, and they have, uh, as all of the producers do, they have their own sort of proprietary growing technology and concepts. Um, everyone, you know, every time we go to new presentations with respect to producers, every one of them basically says they're the lower, lowest cost producer and, um, uh, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt from our perspective. Um, they're all producing significant amounts of medical marijuana or going to be producing significant amounts of mar medical marijuana. Um, and then as of next year, they'll be producing uh, recreational use marijuana. Um, we believe that all of these companies are very, very representative of the growing industry and all of their ability to refine their production uh, facilities um, and processes and lower the overall costs um, of producing medical marijuana, which will ultimately increase their profitability. So Abcan is a very good uh, proponent of, uh, of those processes and strategy. Uh, Arena Pharmaceuticals. It's, it's a biopharmaceutical again. Um, it's based out of the U.S. Uh, it's in the process of developing. It, it has many other drugs, but it is in the process of uh, developing a very important marijuana-based product, um, APD371. It's still in um, uh, early stage testing, um, but we believe and they believe very firmly that this is going to have uh, great ancillary effects from a medical use perspective to the to the industry. Um, it's not really marijuana specific from um, that perspective, but it is, um, you know, a, a cannabis-based uh, product, uh, and they believe that they're going to be able to um, do some wonderful things with this drug going forward, um, and the, the growth prospect for sales of this um, are, are exponential, according to ARENA. So uh, we thought it was a strong candidate to be in, in our portfolio uh, for HMMJ. And <clears throat> so on an overall basis, um, uh, so that was a little bit of an update on, on the new names that we've added to the portfolio. You know, we still see a huge growth prospect for the marijuana industry, for biopharmaceuticals that are getting involved in um, cannabinoids and, and THC-related products from that perspective. The fund itself, um, HMMJ, you know, was really created to provide a diverse uh, exposure to the medical marijuana industry and the ultimately recreational use marijuana industry. Um, you know, it's very, very liquid. It trades millions of dollars of shares every single day. Uh, it trades at a very tight spread. Um, we can get in and out of the medical marijuana industry from an exposure perspective very, very easily for investors through the use of HMMJ. Um, you can use it for hedging purposes. You can use it for direct exposure purposes. Um, you know, but the passive nature of HMMJ, it being an index ETF, um, you know, it, it provides that nice, round, diversified exposure and all the benefits of being an ETF itself. Um, strong exposure to Canada um, and the growing industry here, um, the long-term recreational use prospects that all of the cannabis producers here in Canada have um, on their shelf. You know, there's the prospects of consolidation in the marijuana industry. We know that will happen at some point in time. Um, uh, you know, with every new industry, um, <clears throat> there's always growth prospects and uh, or significant growth prospects, and there's always changes which happen in the industry from uh, uh, issue buying issuers. At some point in time, we believe that the tobacco industry is going to get very interested in the marijuana industry as cigarette sales continue to go down and marijuana sales, we think, are going to continue to go up. Um, as the industry grows, the index and the ETF continues to have the flexibility to add more and more companies in both the, the medical and the recreational 
um, uh, use as it is more is legalized in more um, <clears throat> countries like Canada. Um, externally, you know, we're invested in a company that is the largest producer in Uruguay, where recreational use, um, medical marijuana use is also um, approved. So, you know, continuing to grow, Germany, which is a medical marijuana um, uh, federally legalized company as well, a country, sorry, and, you know, there are many new countries that are coming online like that uh, from that perspective. Um, you know, we will only really be investing in companies where there is some level of federal uh, legislation involved in those jurisdictions where the, the companies we believe are operating primarily um, uh, under a legal uh, uh, regulatory regime. So again, just a, a quick recap, you know, the ETF, HMMJ or HMMJ.U, you have the choice out there now. Um, it is a passive index product. We're going to continue to um, uh, work with Selective on the index. The index will continue to evolve. As I mentioned, it will be dropping the name Medical as well, which uh, coincides with our recent dropping of the uh, Medical out of the name of our ETF. Uh, we will not be changing the hedging exposure, so there will continue to be Canadian dollar um, and U.S. dollar assets in the portfolio. Um, and we will continue to rebalance this on a quarterly basis. And I guess I will turn it back over to Mark um, yeah, briefly. Thanks. thanks very much, Steve. Uh, fantastic presentation. I think it uh, gave everybody a really good overview of you know the strategy and the index components of this ETF and, you know, the growth opportunity that we potentially see continuing to go forward uh, despite, you know, recent performance. There's, there's long-term growth opportunities that exist. I'm going to open up now to Q&A. So if you have any questions, we've had a couple uh, come in. Uh, now's the time. Again, just on the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen, or sorry, the, the right-hand side of your screen, uh, feel free to put those in, and we'll try to address as many as we can before our, our time runs out. But I do have uh, a couple ones uh, right out of the gate here for you, Steve. Uh, the first one, it may have to do with the fact that, uh, you know, we said that the weights are market cap weighted, and that can be a little bit jargony for people, particularly for new ETFs. So we did have a question about, how do we determine the relative weights of the different companies within the ETF? And as an extension to that, you mentioned you know that there is some divergence between what we hold and the index holds. You know what is the relative weight given to those divergent companies in the index? Uh, that's a really good question, Mark. Um, thank you to whomever from the audience put that through. So when we market cap weight um, uh, the portfolio, uh, it, it happens at the time of the rebalance. We know what names are going to be in the e in the index. Um, you know, they usually make an announcement um, a few days before the actual index rebalancing date. So we have an idea of what names will be in the portfolio at that point in time as well, because we have a, an obligation ourselves um, uh, with the TMX and, and the uh, Ontario Securities Commission that we are doing our own due diligence on the underlying companies and what they're doing themselves. So we have to make a determination of whether or not um, they're going to be in the portfolio or not uh, in HMMJ's portfolio. So we, as Mark said, there is some divergence um, between the index and ourselves. Once we've determined what names we believe we will hold in the ETF, um, and this could be names that are in the index um, or names that are, we prospectively will think that will be in the index on a going forward basis, uh, we do run a market cap weighting um, across the portfolio, looking at the size of the company on a relative basis. So, um, you know, if there's 20 names in the portfolio and you add up the market cap of all of those securities, which is essentially the shares outstanding of the company times the current market price, and obviously that changes every day, but we fix sort of a value of, uh, of the market cap of that company on or about the rebalance date from that determination of that market cap relative to the total market cap of the whole portfolio, we can determine what the weight is. Now, for a company like Scott's Miracle Grow, if we just didn't cap the market cap weights, Scott's Miracle Grow would actually end up being um, somewhere between 25 and 30% of the fund's actual weight. 
um, because we cap things at 10, then the weights flow down to the names with the smaller market cap from then. And then it gets prorated down and continue to prorate down. So we really start at the top and we find all of the names that fit into the right criteria. And so we have to do several layers of screening and applying excess market cap to various different companies all the way down the, uh, the market cap screen to the lowest name in the portfolio. And you know it's really through this process that we determine the the prospective portfolio weight that we're looking for in the individual names. Um, then adding in names which are not in the index uh, or names that were previously in the fund uh, or index um, and then allocating weights to that, that is a little bit more discretionary, but we look at it on the basis of the names that we don't have from the index, uh, and then we're trying to establish a weight that we believe is reasonable. Um, again, all for the purposes of trying to track the performance of the index or maybe slightly outperform the performance of the index uh, on an overall basis. So we don't ever want to be underperforming the index, but we're trying to make the portfolio replicate that performance as much as possible. Does that Perfect. help, Mark? Yeah, I think that's a great answer and made it very clear as to, you know, why we're holding it. And, you know, again, with the market cap weight, you're you're really trying to capture the, the size and scope of the industry and market cap weighting is the most basic way to weight an index. And with a growing industry like that, it, it makes sense from a weighting perspective to try to capture at that moment in time, you know, who are the industry leaders in, in the area. Uh, our next question is, um, you know, going back to that first slide where we talked about the adult use market in Canada, you know, will this ETF be able to benefit from the legalization of marijuana usage in Canada? Because, I mean, that hasn't occurred yet. Um, so, but it's obviously the huge growth opportunity uh, for the producers in particular. Um, you know, how would this ETF benefit from the uh, in the legalization of marijuana in Canada? Well, I guess in our view, Mark, um, you know, there are a limited number of licensed federally producers of medical marijuana. Uh, like under the proposed legislation, everybody who wants to will be able to produce a certain number of plants themselves personally if they want to. Um, but not everybody has the means to do that or, or has the inclination to do that. You know, the medical um, marijuana producers that are licensed currently will continue to have those licenses on, on a recreational use. Every one of them has to meet very, very strict um, productions and standards um, with respect to being able to uh, to grow marijuana. And to that extent, the number of licensed producers is not going to change substantially just because of the uh, the legislation changes of recreational use. The federal government is the federal government is still going to very um, uh, you know in depth look at every single one of these producers um, that they that they are licensing, continue to make sure that they meet the standards, and they're not going to allow licenses to those that who they. Um, who they don't want to. I mean, currently we believe that only 3% of those people that apply for licenses to produce marijuana are, produ are have been given um, a license to produce marijuana. So the federal government is doing a very, very strict job of limiting those who, to the, or limiting the marijuana production to those who they think can continue to meet those standards going forward. And it's those companies that are ramping up production right now in anticipation, growing space, growing um, uh, all the pieces that they need from a production perspective to be able to um, meet the potential recreational demand, which we think will be there uh, come July 1, 2018. Perfect. Uh, we have a lot of fast and furious questions coming in here. Um, I'm assuming this may be from someone that's not in Canada, but we have someone asking, um, you know, is this ETF listed or available uh, on global banks um, outside of Canada? I think that's a pretty straightforward answer there. Only listed in well, Canada, the, but uh, uh, the, the ETF is only listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the other ancillary electronic exchanges in Canada. Um, we are only offering uh, for sale our units through Canadian dealers that uh, have access to those exchanges. Um, that said, there are um, you know various forms of uh, foreign investors um, that can open accounts in Canada, and as long as you're dealing through a Canadian dealer. Um, you can buy units of the uh, HMMJ through the facilities of the TSX or the other electronic exchanges. Just on the fees, I mean, 
the fee the fee disclosure on this ETF it's 75 basis points I mean generally the MER should be in around that 75 to 80 basis points when all in on a cost basis there's no other uh, I guess the person's wondering if there's any other ancillary fees with an ETF like this uh, there there's the management fee plus the government's cut HST is always there and then there is always some ancillary operating costs on top of that um, you know working with selective we have um, you know we have a lot of business that we do with Selective, so we're we're trying to keep sort of index licensing fees generally to a minimum, and those are all costs that the ETF does absorb at the end of the day: custody, transfer agent, accounting, um, and some other operational expenses. You know, all the third-party service providers that work for an ETF; those are all operating costs. And but to the extent that the the ETF itself can't absorb those costs, we do cap the MERs, and we expect. Uh, the MER for this ETF to be, um, you know, less than 90 basis points on an all-in basis. And uh, we have a question in terms of, will some of these companies be taken over by bigger players in the industry? And I think I would go a step further, Steve, on that and say, or players outside of the industry. I think that's actually one of the big opportunities here, is it not? Uh, absolutely. We believe so. You know, they're, they're, this industry is growing. It is still very young. There's still a lot of small players out there. Um, that are getting into it. There's, you know, 42 licensed producers, but not all of them are, have publicly listed securities at this stage. Um, and, to the, and many of them have been, you know, approached by larger companies. Um, they're the, as I mentioned before, the tobacco companies uh, have been looking at this industry. There's a lot of potential uh, growth in the industry, and there's a lot of potential players that want to get into this industry. I'm going to treat it akin to sort of like the Canadian ETF industry and all the banks that are uh, and large mutual fund companies that are now entering the industry. You know, we used to have in in 2014 there was only 10 ETF producers, and now there's only 25. Now there's more than 25 ETF producers in Canada. So we see the same thing happening with the marijuana industry, and there's going to be lots of takeover targets out there ultimately. All right, we're uh, we're gonna have to uh, wrap that up. We're over at that forty minute mark. Uh, you know, any questions that we have uh, left over from people? I know maybe a couple more have come in at the end here. Uh, we'll have someone from Horizons reach out to you with an answer. Uh, but with that, I'd like to thank you very much, Steve, for your time today, and uh, also everyone who's uh, had attended this webinar. Uh, you know, again, I want to highlight um, the. Uh, <clears throat> the resources that were available to you. Um, you know, if you have any further questions, again, we're a very interactive firm. Uh, you can always reach out to us at uh, info at info at horizonsetfs.com uh, to talk to uh, either uh, a customer service representative or a wholesaler directly if you are, uh, if you are a financial advisor. Um, we spend lots of time talking about this ETF, as you can appreciate. So I know there's always more questions, and it's hard to get to them all on a 40-minute call, uh, but we will make every effort to get back to you. Um, and note that this call is recorded, so uh, you will be free to listen again to the following to content uh, following this live stream call. Uh, all attendees will be given a link uh, to re-listen to this. Uh, that includes if you're advisors who want to share this with clients. Um, obviously, that's something that you can do. So without further ado, then, I'd uh, like to thank Steve again for his time and thank all of you for attending. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye, everybody.